talk about one of your favorite kings, I'm sure, um, Ashur Banipal, who ruled from 668 BC to 631 BC, or approximately 630 BC. Ashur Bani Api, which means Ashur, the god Ashur has created a son. And his name is spelled in different ways. Sometimes it's A S S U R and so on. So you'll see it spelled in different ways. Just to make it more phonetically easier, we're going to spell it Ashur Banipal as it is spelled in top here. Is Ashur Banipal Sardanapalus, a legendary figure in Greek and Roman times and even up until today? Uh, Sardanapalus's name has been associated with King Ashur Banipal. Perhaps it is someone different, but it, it has been associated with a kind of a weak um, an effeminate king of the Assyrian Empire. And uh, there's a question of whether really Sardanapalus is Ashur Banipal. Keep in mind, as um, we have talked before about Queen Semiramis and the legends surrounding Queen Semiramis and the unreliability, according to the archaeological record, of the existence of the person known as Queen Semiramis in many of the writings. Now, she was not a person who was completely mythical. She may have existed in the form of a person by the name of uh, Samuramit, who was the wife of Shamshi Adad and the mother of King Adad uh, uh, Nirari. But certainly the person portrayed in many of the legendary writings of the Greeks and the Romans and which eventually goes into, is transmitted into our own language, modern Assyrian today, Malikta Shamiram, uh, is legendary. And it's the same with Sardanapalus. Sardanapalus is thought to be the last king of Assyria. He is thought to be a very um, uh, effeminate and careless king who is also ruthless. So kind of the worst qualities of uh, a king that someone can have. And of course, he's been made the stuff of legend for many um, authors, uh, fictional writers, uh, many artists. And uh, this is one painting which was uh, done in the 1800s in England and uh, it portrays the, uh, the dream of Sardanapalus. But who really was Ashur Banipal, the king? Who was he? Well, he was a younger son of uh, Sarhaddun and Ishara Hamad. Uh, his paternal grand, uh, grandmother was uh, Naqiya Zakutu, the wife of uh, King Sennacherib, who was the mother of Sarhaddun. This is his grandmother, who lives into his reign. And uh, Sarhaddun had 18 sons and daughters, and Ashurbanipal may have been his fourth eldest son. There were others um, uh, who were the sons of, of Sarhaddun, but unfortunately, either because of their health problems, as we discussed last time, Sarhaddun had uh, numerous health problems. Either because of their health problems or other issues, Ashurbanipal was selected along with um, uh, his brother, who uh, eventually he is going to have a problem with. So stay tuned for that. By late 673, um, Sarhaddun had originally uh, planned on um, um, assigning a different king. By late 73, uh, uh, Sinad and uh, who is the eldest uh, and who was designated 677, had either died or fallen out of favor. We're not sure uh, which happened exactly. Uh, but Shamashuma Ukin, who was the eldest now um, living son, was chosen to be the king of Babylon. But his younger son, Ashur Banipal, uh, was chosen as uh, the ruler of Assyria and really the center of power. And another son, Shamash Mitu Ubalit was overlooked. Why that is, this is the intrigue within the royal family. Among 18 sons, there's uh, bound to be competition. Uh, we'll find out that 
for example, this, this pattern repeats itself again and again with different kingdoms. Among the Ottomans, they had a custom. Once they selected one of the sons of the uh, uh, Sultan, uh, the Ottomans would then strangle the rest as they were uh, babies. So that's one way to kind of rid oneself of competition. Yes, people did strange things. The succession plans of Sarhaddon went into place. As we know, he died en route to invading Egypt because Egypt had rebelled. The queen mother, Naqiya, who outlived her son, uh, Sarhaddon, ensured that her, his succession plans were uh, carried out as planned in Yaru, in Yar, March of 672. Ashur Paul. Uh, Sarhaddon's oldest son was to sit on the throne of Assyria in Nineveh, and Shamash Shuma Ukin, his eldest living son, was to become king of Babylon. And everything was going to be hunky dory. Everything was going to be fine. This was the perfect arrangement. Why did Sarhaddon do this? Why did he assign one of his sons, who was the elder son, to a lesser position, in effect, in Babylon, and his oldest son? or his, excuse me, his youngest son in Nineveh, the person who was really going to rule the entirety of the Assyrian Empire, which was its greatest extent at this time. Well, if you remember, uh, Sarhaddon had a number of difficulties and was very traumatized with his experience uh, based on what had happened to him with his brothers, the sons of King Sennacherib, who wound up killing their, their own father because Sennacherib changed his mind. You recall he had originally assigned Urdu Mulisi as the one to take power. And then uh, after about 12 years of Urdu Mulisi being the crown prince and kind of waiting around, well, what happens is um, uh, Sennacherib changes his mind and he assigns uh, Sanhedrin. And it is thought that the reason he did that was because um, Sarhaddon was the son of Naqiya, and Naqiya had been the favorite of Sennacherib's second or third wife, and she had a great deal of influence. So there was a lot of rage within the royal family, and it wound up being a very um, tough situation for everyone because Sennacherib was murdered as, a, as an older king by his oldest son. Who had cooperated with another son and eventually fled Assyria. So in order to prevent that, Sarhaddun thought maybe the best thing to do is to split the kingdom, and oftentimes this works. Does it work here? We'll see. Ashurbanipal was very unique because he wasn't technically trained for the kinghood, or the kingdom, um, kingship. Excuse me. In the early days. He became uh, a great scholar and really appreciated scholarships very scholarship very early on in his um, in his uh, uh, life from childhood. And so he tells us that um, the gods Shamash and Edith placed at my disposal the lore of the diviner, a craft that cannot be changed. Marduk, the sage of the gods, granted. Um, um, granted me a broad mind and extensive um, extensive knowledge as a gift. The god Nabu, the scribe of everything. Nabu was the lord of wisdom, the great scribe in the heavens, um, bestowed on me the precepts of his craft as a present, and so on and so forth. And he tells us that he is capable of arguing with expert diviners. Uh, he can resolve complex mathematical divisions and multiplications that do not have an easy solution. So he's also very good in math, in addition to being very good in reading obscure texts. And by this time, by the reign of Ashurbanipal, the writing of the Sumerians becomes something very archaic, something very much in the past, thousands of years into the past. But he takes a lot of pride in trying to figure out what were his ancestors saying. So uh, there's this link to the past. And, and of course, the, the link is really uh, the secret link here are the tablets that are uh, 
preserved. Um, unlike scrolls, for example, which are preserved perhaps for hundred year, hundreds of years, tablets are actually preserved for thousands. We still have the tablets written in very ancient days in Mesopotamia, going back to 5,000, 6,000 years ago. In addition, Ashur Manipal is also trained as a warrior with carefully selected companions. We assume he means people well-trained in the art of fighting. This is how I spent all of my days. I cantered on thoroughbreds, rode stallions that were raring to go. I held a bow and made arrows fly as befits a warrior. I threw quivering lances as if they were javelins. I took the reins of a chariot, like the, a charioteer, and made the rims of the wheels spin. I held shields like a military specialist. I am proficient in the best technical lore of all specialists, every one of them. So, um, and he's also learning lordly behavior. So he has to be trained physically. And of course, he takes a lot of pride in this. And we, of course, should think and reflect on the fact that his father, Sarhaddin, being very ill, he certainly appreciated the athleticism of his own son, in addition to his scholarly. Uh, pursuits. So here's a man who brings the best of an intellectual and uh, a physical. He's both an athlete and an intellectual. And so he brings the best of both to the position that he has. And so he reigns as king in 668 after the death of his father. His brother uh, takes over in Babylon. And at this time, it's very important to understand the influence of the great Assyrian Empire. There had never been in the history of the Near East, indeed in the history of the world, a culture that had such great influence on everywhere uh, around it, into the heart of Iran and beyond, into Afghanistan, north into the Caucasus, uh, all the way to the Greek uh, Isles, deep into the Mediterranean, south into Egypt and Africa, into Arabia, into the Persian Gulf. And the Assyrian Empire was growing during the time of Ashurbanipal. When Ashurbanipal takes power, uh, the kingdom of Lydia, um, which is located near the Greek Isles, uh, towards the western part of Anatolia, has a um, a messenger sent because they hear of the greatness of Ashurbanipal, uh, and they send a messenger from the kingdom of Lydia. Um, and uh, no one in the beginning could understand what this man is saying because his language is so different. Um, Ashurbanipal and his advisors, after trying to figure out, they finally found him an interpreter. I mean, you can imagine kind of the crazy situation here. You have this foreigner coming from a very far land, a language which has not been heard by the Assyrians, and they encounter this person, and eventually they found someone who translates for him. And he is told, uh, Ashur Banipal is told, that the god Ashur has come to the dream of the king of uh, Lydia, and uh, that in his dream, uh, Ashur Banipal is a, someone who is glimmering. Uh, and is told, uh, the king is told that the uh, king should seek him out for assistance because various tribes of Sumerians who are in the area are um, harassing the kingdom of Lydia. Ashurbanipal establishes good relations, although those relations fluctuate with the kingdom of Lydia. It wouldn't be surprising if uh, the Assyrian uh, Empire remained, it would spread into Western Anatolia, eventually in the next step and uh, into the Greek Isles. In the Levant, we had a number of problems in the past, but by and large, uh, by the time of the end of Sarhaddin's reign, a lot of these problems had been resolved. However, the problem of Egypt still remained. And what was the problem of Egypt? Egypt was attempting to um, like a superpower, acting like a superpower and attempting to influence the states of the Levant. The Levant, of course, is the Eastern Mediterranean. And what's in it for the Egyptians? Of course, there are economic benefits, security benefits, as well as political benefits. 
And at this time, Egypt is being ruled by what we know as the Black Pharaohs. The Kingdom of Kush or Nubia or Sudan has sent uh, its armies into Egypt and it's ruling. Egypt is a bit fractured, but the kings of Kush or the Pharaohs of Kush have dominated Egypt and are ruling it and are attempting to exert influence at the expense of the Assyrians on the Levant. So Sarhaddon dealt with this problem early on. In other words, he was able to stem the situation in Egypt, uh, Sanfiru, and King Sargon II also had conflicts with the Egyptians, but they never really entered uh, Egypt. Sarhaddon did. But after Sarhaddon's departure, he tries uh, Baharqa, who is a uh, one of the black pharaohs in Egypt, a, a king of Kush, tries to uh, stir rebellion again. And the people who had been assigned by Sarhaddun as uh, the Assyrians who were supposed to be administering Egypt are massacred. In fact, there's a tablet explaining this, that the Assyrians who were there were killed. And uh, this includes, of course, the diplomats and the soldiers. And of course, Sarhaddun uh, seeks revenge and he heads um, to Egypt. Unfortunately, he dies at Haran, Sarhaddun being very ill. Ashur Banipal takes over and uh, Ashur Banipal dispatches a large army to Egypt. Uh, numerous Western vassals pay tribute again, just to make sure that they're in Ashur Banipal's good graces. And so uh, the Assyrians once again occupy Memphis. That's where Cairo is today in Egypt. So Cairo is Memphis in the past, is taken over by the Assyrians. They hold it this time. And um, uh, th the kings who are there are made to swear a loyalty oath. As we will see, they betray that loyalty oath. They betray that loyalty oath they're taking to Assyria and uh, sent back. And this is one of the issues that we're going to be discussing uh, next time when we talk about Ashur Banipal and other Assyrian kings, because this topic comes up again and again in even modern writings, is that uh, Assyrian kings are seen as particularly cruel. Well, um, we're going to see this example repeat itself with other kings and other cultures and other civilizations. But the important thing to note is that this was not a black and white situation where the Assyrians were cruel and, for example, the Persians were very kind. That's kind of the picture you get typically from a lot of historians and from a lot of people who know history from a very superficial perspective. That's not the case here. And a perfect example is how Egyptians who betrayed King Ashurbanipal, instead of being punished, for example, by being executed, are brought to Assyria. They are, in the words of one scholar, they are indoctrinated in the Assyrian court and they are sent back to Egypt to behave as good kings uh, and swear a loyalty oath. And so uh, we are told that Ashurbanipal makes uh, Nico, the king of Egypt, of, of uh, Lower Egypt, swear a new loyalty oath of fealty before he was permitted to return his post, his post in Egypt. The son of Baharqa, Baharqa eventually escapes uh, the Assyrians, and the son of Baharqa uh, comes into, uh, excuse me, the nephew of Baharqa, not the son, um, Tanutamun, uh, he comes to power and he seeks to stir a rebellion. It does not work. When news of the attack on the Assyrian holdings uh, reaches Ashurbanipal, the, he dispatches his army again to Memphis, and the Assyrians set foot in Egypt. And as soon as they set foot in Egypt, the last black pharaoh escapes deep into the Sudan, and um, and he escapes to Thebes in, in particular, which is uh, in, in the south, in the, what's called the Upper Egypt. And uh, then uh, Thebes is captured, and the Assyrians take um, a ton of goods, largely gold, 
And there are many Egyptians who are brought into Assyria as a result of this. I took the road in, pursuer, in pursuit of Tanu Taman, and I marched as far as the th city of Thebes, this fortified city. He saw the assault of my battle array and abandoned the city of Thebes. He fled to the city of Kipi. With the support of the god Ashur and the goddess, I conquered that city in its entirety. I carried off substantial booty, which was without number, from inside the city of Thebes. I made my weapons prevail over Egypt and Cush, and thus achieved victory. With full hands, as the modern Assyrian saying goes, I return safely to Nineveh, my capital city. So Egypt is, is pacified at this time. Now, remember, this was no small task, given how difficult travel was through the desert and, and so on. Even the Persians had a tough time holding uh, Egypt with, with mightier army and larger armies than the Assyrians. But the Assyrians were able to achieve something spectacular and add Egypt to um, their economic um, military and political power. North of Assyria and Mania, which Mania is uh, south of Lake Udumia and going all the way to the Caspian Sea. This territory, um, Ashurbanipal had little trouble with because it was largely uh, well established prior to Ashurbanipal coming by other Assyrian kings, including his father. Um, the kingdom had begun to infringe on some of the territories, in other, words, in other words, taking certain territories that they weren't supposed to. So there are a lot of loyalty oaths, remember, there are a lot of agreements that are held with these states. And when they see a shift in Assyrian power, or they see that Assyrian power is really shifting to a different location, uh, different geographic location, they may want to take it. They want to take advantage of the situation, and they tried somewhat. But of course, this was a very bad move on the king, um, uh, Ashiri, uh, the Manian king, who tried to make a, a nighttime attack. He was beaten back, and he was defeated. Eventually, because his people were very displeased with what he had done, he had breached an agreement with the Assyrians. His body was, he was killed and he was dragged through the streets and, um, and everything seems to go okay for the Assyrians in this territory. It's the same thing with the Medes. The Medes, now I have to say one thing about the Medes. Oftentimes uh, we're gonna hear about this, that after the fall of the Assyrian empire, the Medes as a people uh, create what is called as the Median Empire and the Neo-Babylonians create the Neo-Babylonian Empire. There's been a lot of questioning of um, this history. And, and this is what happens oftentimes. I don't want to go too much into this, this uh, detail, but I just want to tell you that oftentimes the question is asked, well, what, what new is there to know about history? Um, every once in a while, I'll, I think I'll meet someone who um, really draws my annoyance uh, to the max. And that's a person who says, well, I know everything. I know everything about Assyrian history. I know everything that is going to be discussed. Well, I'm very proud to tell you that I don't know everything. And it's very hard uh, to know everything. Um, why? Because we're constantly discovering uh, new items from history. We're constantly digging up new archaeological evidence. We're constantly seeing new writings, new texts, and we are analyzing and reanalyzing these. So it's very important to keep uh, an open mind when it comes to understanding history, because oftentimes, such as, for example, as we speak right now, uh, Nineveh is being dug up again. And, and we only have really seen 10% of uh, the archaeological evidence in Nineveh. So as far as the Medians are concerned, or the, the uh, Medde Pavis, as they're, they're called in Assyria, there's a lot of question as to whether they constituted a single people 
for many peoples. And of course, as some of you know, the Kurds claim that the Medes are their ancestors. Of course, there is no um, such evidence. There is evidence to suggest that many types of Iranian peoples, and the Kurds are an Iranian people, uh, the Persians, the Elamites, the Medes, the Kurds, and others, the Lures, and so on. These are uh, people who are an Iranian people, like, like the Semites, for example, the, the Hebrews and the Syrians and the Arabs, those are Semites. Um, we're talking about language here. Um, and the Hurrians, those are another set of peoples. So whether the Medes constituted one people or not is really a question for scholars today. Regardless of, of that uh, kind of questioning of, uh, and, and these people question whether there was a Median Empire at all. Um, the Assyrians during this time dominate uh, in Ashurbanipal in a single campaign because, again, his ancestors have been here before and have been to the area of Urmia have been to the area of uh, all the way up to the Caspian Sea. One of the biggest uh, issues for the Assyrians at this time was the kingdom of Elam, which is a, um, as we said, an Iranian kingdom. The Elamites are Iranian kingdoms. Later in class, we're going to see that within the Church of the East, for example, we're going to have a Matrapolit of Elam. And oftentimes people confuse, like, what's what's this term? What's this what's this seat of a metropolitan or a, an archbishop in Elam? What does this mean? Well, it refers to an area, and this area was a conglomerate of uh, many different types of people. So, um, I, I see your questions. By the way, I just want to tell you I see your questions, but I'm going to respond to them at the end of the class. So. Uh, hang tight, please. Um, so this this area presented a problem for Ashurbanipal. Initially, Ashurbanipal had good relations with Elam because uh, Sarheddin, his father, had a treaty with Elam, allowing him to really focus on the western side of the empire and to focus on Egypt. But Elam becomes a problem for the Assyrians. And one of their kings, uh, Otaku, um, the king of, of Elam, um, decides to kind of push his luck with Ashurbanipal, and Ashurbanipal says, I marched against Otaku, the king of the land of Elam, uh, who did not remember the kindness of the father who had engendered me, nor did he respect my friendship. You'll see a lot of this type of um, um, this, this pattern of, of phrasing relationships for King Ashurbanipal. Um, you know, everyone knows during this time what's right and wrong. You don't just rush into someone's territory and take spoils from a kingdom. You just don't do it. What do you have to do? You have to justify it. Now, whether Ashurbanipal is truly justified in saying, for example, uh, this person did not remember the kindness and he began to. Uh, issue proclamations which were troubling to me. Whether that was justified or not, we don't know, but we only had one side of the story here. So after famine occurs in the land of Elam and hunger has set in, I sent to him grain, which sustains the lives of the people and thus held him by the hand, as it were in Assyrian. I held his hand, meaning I helped him. So why would the Assyrian king help the land of Elam? As we said before, and this is the problem that many historians do not carefully look at, and that is how nuanced, how complicated the Assyrian empire was, how sophisticated it was in its military, political, and economic dealings with others. So if you were able to solve a problem and Ashurbanipal is attempting to solve a problem in terms of a relationship with, for example, the king of Elam. Well, how would you do it? Would you do it through the use of force? No, you would do it through diplomacy. You would do it through economic assistance, for example. And we see these patterns even today with great powers. One of the very reasons that U.S. aid 
has been established by our own American empire. So um, his people who had fled on account of famine and settled in Assyria until it rained. So Asher Paul gives Elamites uh, refuge in Assyria and uh, sends them back in safety. In other words, he grants them temporary status, uh, temporary immigration status in Assyria because they had been starving and they needed help. And uh, can you imagine now, you know, you, you call all Assyrian kings ruthless and, and barbaric and bloodthirsty. Well, here they are allowing people to come into their land and to uh, share in their, um, in their abundance of foods and so on, and also helping uh, send grain to overseas. So in this case, it's not overseas, to another land. But the Elamite whose aggression I had not thought possible. So he tells us here that he's very surprised by the aggression shown against him by the Elamite king, whom I had not contemplated, a fight with whom I had not contemplated. I wasn't looking for a fight. But the Gambulian, now who's the Gambulian? Um, uh, Gambulian is a, um, a king of a small city-state which is uh, Aramaic speaking, uh, some term it Aramean, but we don't have the evidence that they classify themselves as an Aramean uh, people. But the Gambulian servants who belonged to me and others who had sided with them incited him, incited the king of Elam uh, with uh, lies to fight with the land of Somar and Ekeb. So he's not necessarily attacking Assyria here. He's attacking Somar and Ekhet, but Somar and Ekhet is being held by the Assyrians under the king uh, who is the older brother of Asher ben Paul. He is the king of Babylon. Urtaku, uh, king of Elam, is particularly a troubling case for Asher ben Paul, who writes that the gods themselves judged my case with Urtaku, with whom I was not hostile towards, but who started a fight with me. The gods dispatch him uh, themselves in one inscription which emphasizes a number of ways that the king has died. In that year, they destroyed his life through a bad death. They assigned to him Kur Nugia, a place of no return. It's kind of a hell. The hearts of the great gods, my lords, were not appeased, and the angry mood of their lordly majesties were not pacified. They overthrew his kingship and took away his dynasty. They made somebody else assumed dominion over Elon. There's a lot of religious language um, that we should uh, understand as partly political uh, and diplomatic language, and it's also partly divine language, because um, of course you are supposed to do what is right, and the ancient Assyrians know that you are supposed to do what is right by the gods, and there's a constant reference to what gods the god. Sometimes it's a singular god, for example, reference to Ashur or reference to Marduk. Uh, sometimes it is the gods, all of them in their pantheon, um, looking out for good to be done. So um, here in this situation, it is perceived that the gods have turned the tides against the previous king and another king takes power. Uh, Tuman uh, and Asher Bani Paul describes this this king as the very image of the of a Galu demon, and one of the reasons why he describes him so is because Asher Bani Paul describes this particular king of Elam as someone who's very disfigured, and and it is thought that because he practices evil, he is um, uh, he looks this way because he has engaged in so much evil in his life. This is what we are led to believe according to the text. So he seizes power, and what does he try to do? He tries to exterminate the entire extended family of the previous king. Well, they will not have it, and so they escape to Assyria. They come to Nineveh, where Asher Manipal grants them asylum. And of course, uh, Tuman is displeased. He's not happy with Asher Manipal granting asylum to the um, the offspring of the previous king. Over the course of several years, 
uh, relations between Assyria and Elam remain tense. There's a uh, kind of a Cold War situation between the two sides. And uh, in a very daring move in 653, uh, the Elamite king decides to march towards Nineveh. What uh, gives them such confidence is not entirely clear, but Ashurbanipal is in Arbella at this time. He takes his army and marches south towards Dur, which is in central Mesopotamia, as quickly as he could. Uh, he uh, meets uh, Tumon and uh, the, uh, the um, Elamites start to head back to Susa. Uh, but the armies eventually meet in a place called Tel Tuba, which is situated on the Olaya River uh, between Iran and Iraq. <clears throat> the battle is bloody, and uh, the Elamite king is killed in battle. And we're going to see a couple of the um, uh, reliefs that show the, the battle in great detail. They're, they're currently in the British Museum. And the fugitive Elamite princes um, who had accompanied the Assyrians, who were the sons of the previous king, are installed as rulers. Here you see in, in a um, one part of what, what is really, for lack of a better word, kind of a comic strip uh, showing scenes and sequence. You see the Elamite king kind of kneeling, and he is hit with an arrow. And, um, and previous to that, you see his son trying to rescue him as he is being wounded, um, and they are fleeing uh, the Assyrians. And what happens to the king eventually? His head is severed. I know you're saying, uh, you know, how could they do that? Well, everybody did that at that time. And uh, so his head is severed, and it is brought back in a container. Uh, of salt so that, that it could be preserved. Perhaps you're not looking for this detail, but that's exactly what, what the text tell us. His head is preserved and it is brought back to King Ashurbanipal who um, symbolically hangs it on a tree um, for, for onlookers to, to look at as a uh, commemoration of what happens to people who um, rebel against Assyria. Along with the Elamites, of course, also uh, the Arabs are defeated and other people who associate with them, um, including people who are tribal living in these areas. So Syrian power reigns supreme at this time. Um, another thing that happens is that Ashurbanipal, at the request of one of his generals, Bel Ibni, sends a letter to uh, the kings of Elam or the rulers of Elam warning, warning them that failure to hand over uh, Nabubel Shumati, who is a rebel, a high profile fugitive, uh, governor of a sea land, meaning of the areas um, that we sometimes refer to as Chaldea or Chaldean tribes. Um, if he is not returned to Assyria, um, then uh, something may happen to Elam. And of course, um, uh, initially, uh, the Elamites uh, do not, and the Assyrians are forced to send troops to Elam to conquer uh, Elam. And uh, of course, um, uh, the Elamites eventually um, transform their position and um, are able to um, make amends with Assyria. Now, Assyrians make a wonderful archaeological discovery during the time that they're in Elam, at this, uh, this particular uh, time. And this, now we're talking about southern Iran. They find a statue of Uruk's the goddess, uh, Nanaya. Um, this image would have apparently been uh, taken uh, for over 1,600 years since the old Akkadian period was returned to its proper place in Uruk. And what this symbolizes for us is that oftentimes uh, we think of Assyrian history as lacking any kind of uh, restorative justice. 
For example, that is often attributed to Persian kings. But what, what we don't know, because we haven't carefully looked at the archives, is that the Syrians oftentimes restore what they think was wrong to people who have been wronged. So, for example, Cyrus is given a lot of credit for allowing certain people to return. What we don't know is that Cyrus was not an inventor of this policy. He wasn't the first to have this, uh, what is called a, um, the Human Rights Declaration of Cyrus. Uh, that is within the exact style the Assyrians also function. King Sargon, King Sennacherib, King Sarhaddon, and now King Ashurbanipal. So King Ashurbanipal's um, number of campaigns uh, destabilized Elam and greatly weakened uh, Uman al-Dashu's authority, the current king. When he returned from hiding, his bid for the throne was challenged by someone else by the name of Ba'i. Ashurbanipal once again wrote about extraditing um, this fugitive. Uh, the former governor uh, found out that he is wanted by Ashurbanipal, and of course, he kills himself. Him and his um, attendant, his, his assistant, uh, kill themselves. Their body is taken and it is sent to uh, Ashurbanipal. Again, their corpse is salted and they are sent to Ashurbanipal as a gesture of goodwill, meaning we don't want any problems with you. Um, and the, the Assyrian soldiers uh, track the Elamite king um, again, and because he has escaped, he's not able to rule. They bring him back to Nineveh. And just like the Egyptian kings um, or the Egyptian pharaohs that were taken into Assyria, he is likely to have been indoctrinated, but he is kept in Assyria. Now, what happens during um, Ashur Bani Paul's reign in 652, several years after he takes power, is that uh, him and his older brother begin to have a back and forth. This arrangement had functioned in, in, uh, from 669 BC up until 652 for several years. In 652, a civil war erupts between North and South of Mesopotamia. And it is between two brothers. It's a very, very unusual situation. But this war erupts between um, Shamashuma Ukin and, um, and his brother. And uh, this war erupts, uh, according to some scholars, such as the Assyriologist Shana Zaya, um, and, and this is the, the stuff that I'm talking about in terms of the Civil War has been um, uh, contributed to largely by Assyriologist uh, Dr. Shana Zaya, who's a professor in Vienna. And uh, hopefully she is going to come to Chicago and we are going to um, have her lecture on this specific topic. We will let you know, stay tuned for that. In the beginning, the letters between the kings, King Ashurbanipal and his brother are very uh, uh, brotherly for lack of a better word, they're very friendly. And uh, it is uh, uh, constant, uh, the reference is made, Ana Shari Ahiya, uh, uh, my lord, uh, my king brother, my brother. So the relationship turned sour when apparently, according to some scholars, uh, Ashur Banipal meddles in the affairs of his older brother and his older brother perhaps being instructed by others, begins to turn against his younger brother in Nineveh. And Ashur Bani Paul becomes very angry at his brother, and he begins to, he begins to refer to his brother as Ahula Kinu. And of course, Kinu from the word Kina or just, um, it can also mean a hostile brother. And this is also a play, according to a seriologist, Shana Zaya, on uh, his name, Shama Shum, Shuma Ukin, uh, Ukin Kinu, and so on. Uh, so it's a play on um, Shemesh has uh, given a, um, a 
established a name. And so the reference here is that he is not Kina after all. It turns out that he's a rotten brother after all. Quite frequently, Ashurmani Paul calls his brother Ahu Nakuru, Nakru, or enemy or brother. The word Nukhraya, which is referenced here in modern Assyrian, is Nakru or Nahru, uh, meaning my enemy. So he refers to him as his enemy. So the brothers go from a very stable situation where Shamashuma Ukin rules Babylon and his younger brother but the true emperor of the empire rules from Nineveh. They have friendly relations. Now it's breaking down and there's hostility and a civil war results from 652 to 648. For four years, war is waged between the two brothers, Ashur Banipal and his older brother. And so uh, King uh, Shamashuma Ukin uh, withdraws to his capital city of Babylon. During the first part of the conflict, the first two years, battles are fought all over, largely in, in the southern area, Solomon and Ekad, or what is known as Babylonia, and in the what's called the Sea Land, which is to the south of that. Given the number of armies on the move and those relationships that uh, Ashur Paul, Paul's brother has made with, for example, certain Arab tribes, certain Elamites and others, um, there is great deal of chaos. And the Assyrian army, of course, uh, suffers a, a great deal, but it also wins a great number of battles. Uh, people switch back and forth uh, because they are either pressured or because they see advantage uh, in being on one side of the civil war versus another. By the way, at this time, the older sister of Ashur Banipal and Shamash Shuma Ukin, to whom we will refer later, tries to solve the problem between the brothers and, um, and, and fails, unfortunately. Now, references oftentimes to the killing of a brother and eventually um, uh, Shamash Shuma Ukin. Um, was not a rival like, for example, the king of the sea land who rebelled against Assyria, where his body should be found, put in salt, and shipped to Ashur Paul. This was his brother. And um, according to a number of scholars, it is to be expected that if you were a soldier who killed the king's brother, that you may not live uh, because it is such a uh, grievous crime. Nevertheless, this is a very difficult time for both brothers, for all Assyrians during this time, for the entire empire, of course. Shamashum Ukin was not a usurper, but he was a legitimate king. we got to remember that his father put him on the throne of Babylon, Sarhaddon, the same father that put Ashur Baipal on the throne of Assyria, on the throne of Nineveh. And, um, and we hear so constantly. Um, we hear in Assyrian records, there's no reference to the killing of the brother. Why? Because he's an Assyrian. He's the brother of the king. He is, after all, royalty. He's not a usurper. He is a legitimate king. So uh, according to Professor Shalazaya, Assyrian rulers do not die in the royal inscriptions, much less uh, are they murdered or commit suicide. It's just a great uh, taboo here. For instance, Ashur Nadin Shumi, this is the son of, um, of Sennacherib, who is uh, taken off screen, as it were, is not mentioned in his father Sennacherib's inscriptions, though it, it was alluded to in a letter and is likely the primary catalyst for Sennacherib's devastating attack in Babylon. So killing royalty is not an easy thing. It is a, uh, a major sin. And this is one way that the Assyrian Empire has maintained itself um, uh, throughout uh, the, um, uh, the centuries. Remember, the Assyrian Empire, unlike many empires, ruled for hundreds of years after you know, typical empire would rule. So the, again, Neo-Babylonian Empire ruled for less than 100 years, about 70 some years. The Persian Empire ruled for a couple of hundred years uh, after the Assyrian Empire. 
uh, Alexander's empire lasted much less than that. So one has to remember the Assyrians ruled for over 700 years as an empire. So how did they do it? By creating a certain reverence for the position of royalty. And this was protected by the gods as well as the state, the Assyrian state. And here's what his brother uh, Ashurbanipal says of um, Shanashum Ukin. Um, he was against Assyria and against the god Ashur. Um, as for Shanashum Ukin, my hostile brother, Ahu Nakru, or Nukhraya, who had planned murder against Assyria and uttered grievous blasphemies against Ashur, who created me. Asha created me. He determined for him a cruel death, Motu Limnu. He consigned him to a fire and destroyed his life. So this is a very rare example of talking about royalty that is taken. But what's unique about this is that his life is not taken by another man. His, he is not executed. He is uh, dealt with by the supreme god of Assyria. He is dealt with by Asha, who takes care of him. Now, the brothers' war created um, a very interesting situation in later writings in, in Aramaic. Um, again, the reference is to Sardanapal or Sardanapalus Ashurbanipal. And in these writings in, in Aramaic, it is suggested that there was an evil king in Babylon who did not listen to his brother, and his brother was very pained to have to deal with the situation um, being presented to him. And uh, he tried to uh, appease his brother, but he was not able to. Of course, these uh, writings go into legendary material. They're not... Uh, um, to be trusted 100%, but like all legends, may refer to something that is legitimate. Ashurbanipal uh, is, while his brother is arguing with him, tells uh, people in Babylon, hey, listen, uh, my fight is not with you, and this is an attempt to use diplomacy, your brotherhood with the Assyrians, and your privileged status, which I have established, remain valid until the present day, um, meaning uh, I am with you. I am trying to help you. But he says he, um, of his brother, locked the city gates of Sipa, Babylon, and Borsippa, uh, cities which, you know, um, it's important to stop here and make this point because oftentimes the, the relationship between what we term Babylonians, not just the people in the city of Babylon, but the entire kind of land of Babylonia, which is an invention. Uh, so it's, it's uh, anachronistic to refer to this area as a Babylonian area. There is no war here between Babylonians and Assyrians. There is a war between two brothers and people that ally with them. And certain people in certain cities in southern Iraq or in Babylonia are with Ashurbanipal and others are not with Ashurbanipal. It has nothing to do with one's ethnicity. That should be very important. So this is not a war of independence on the part of the Babylonians. So um, Ashurbanipal says of this particular person who happens to be his brother, that he plotted evil ways to deprive me of the cult centers and the dwelling places of the great gods whose sanctuaries I had renovated and decorated with gold and silver in whose midst I constantly established appropriate procedures so I am doing good by the gods of the land, and here my brother seeks to block my way. After Ashurbanipal reigns supreme in Babylon, and he does not do what um, his grandfather Sennacherib did to Babylon, which is exhibit a lot of rage, he um, assigns a uh, king by the name of uh, Kandalanu as king of Babylon, who rules from this time until 627 BC. The empire is finally at peace during this time, short of small uh, 
problems here and there, but Ashurbanipal rules this very large empire, which, as we've seen in the map, dominates the entire Near East and North Africa, deep into the Mediterranean and deep into Iranian territory. Its influence goes north into the Caucasus and into Anatolia. Building activities in Assyria and Mesopotamia, there are numerous texts described describing Ashurbanipal's many building activities. Um, we are able to identify at least uh, major programs in, in uh, several uh, Assyrian cities and uh, also cities in Babylon. So in Arbella, Asher, Babylon, Borsippa, Aged, um, so on and so forth in many of the cities, Barbishu. Many of these cities, by the way, are still being dug up as we speak in this class. So there's a lot more forthcoming, and hopefully Iraq's security situation improves year after year, and you'll see more building activity. So I want to say something about Usher Bunny Paul's art and uh, passion for hunting lions. The lion in ancient Assyria represented chaos, disorder, hostility, uh, instability. And the Assyrian king's role, indeed, on his very seal, was to take care of the lion, because the lion was an untamable uh, animal, not the, um, is, is not able to be civilized, as it were. And so through the hunting of lions, the Assyrian king created some of the most wonderful artwork um, known in, in the ancient world, even in the classical world, that shows we don't unfortunately name the, we don't know the name of the artist who did this work, but it is incredible work and it is uh, such detail. Uh, these carvings are such um, a beautiful detail. They resemble very realistic, especially the animals. The figures are very dignified, muscular and strong, uh, but the animals are um, seeking to cause chaos and of course are not able to because they're slaughtered. In one contest, Asher Vanipal is able to slay 18 lions and many scholars think this is symbolic of, uh, of Nineveh's 18 gates and that he's a protector of the city of Nineveh. So a lot of times these sport, uh, sport uh, um, uh, events are done for theatrics, but also a symbolic gesture of the king's ability to reign uh, physically, and intellectually, and spiritually over Assyria. And so these, many of these uh, artifacts during Ashurbani Paul's time are really very unique to the, to the particular artist. And you can see the work of this artist is going to be very different than, for example, uh, artwork done, done during uh, Sennacherib's time or during uh, Sargon II's time, although it borrows upon that. It does uh, seem very much different. <clears throat> now, Asher Paul was also the builder of something you know as the Asher Paul Library. What was the Asher Paul's library? Uh, what was the Asher Paul Library? This was the largest collection of, of written works in the ancient world up until that time, possibly much later, larger than even the Library of Alexandria in its contents. And the good thing, unlike the Library of Alexandria, which was burned and many of the scrolls des destroyed, um, of course, the Ashurbanipal Library also had scrolls which were destroyed, but many of the tablets, because the library was burned, were able to be preserved. And so we have them today in a much more solid fashion than we had them before. Here's a letter that is written to Ashurbanipal. Uh, the king of everything, lord of educated, uh, lord of blank, 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 educated in the arts of skill, who uh, the twisted, blah, blah, who holds the entire to the true path, lover of dot, 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 wise king, expert and learned, king of Assyria, who, have, who has la lavished riches on the great lord Marduk and Sagan, who has renewed the rights and ordinances who has established the regular offerings of the God, who has provided abundantly for the temples of Babylon. Babylon. So Babylon is considered a part of the Assyrian kingdom. Like me, this particular scholar writes, like me, is faithfully bowed to the scribal art, 
wrote to us thus. So the scholar is telling Asher Bani Paul, you are like me. You are faithfully uh, bowed to the scribal art. In other words, you appreciate the scribal art. You appreciate the you appreciate literature. So the king had written to this scholar this way. The entire corpus of the scribal learning, the song corpus, and all the scribal learning, as much as there is, that is in the possession of the great Lord Marduk, my Lord, bring to Nineveh. So he has orders, Asher Benipal orders from all over his empire. This is not just to Babylon. He orders that any text that might be needed in the palace, as many as there are, also rare tablets that are known to you but do not exist in Assyria, send them to me. Known to you, he is talking about plural you, you. He's assigning people. Now I have written to the temple steward and the governor. In the houses where you are set to work, nobody will withhold tablets from you. And if furthermore you come across any tablet or ritual which I myself have not mentioned to you, and it is beneficial to my governance, take it to and send it to me. So Asher Bani Pal is known in the ancient world, especially in Mesopotamia, as a king who loves to collect and appreciates literature uh, from all over the empire. And he is told uh, at one time when he's asking the people of Borsippa for, um, for tablets, the dutiful Borsippans will send back to the king, their lord, the instruction that he wrote as follows, write out all the scribal learning in the property of Nabu and send it to me. Nabu is the lord of the scribes. Complete the instruction. Maybe the king says to himself, we are the ones who, like the citizens of Babylon, will shirk it by using confusing language. In other words, we're going to avoid what you're asking us to do. Now we shall not shirk the king's command. We shall strain and toil day and night to complete the instruction for our lord, the king. We shall write on boards of Cecil wood. We shall respond immediately. In other words, as you wish, as you command, uh, as, as you wish, that is our command. We will listen to you and we will turn over all these items to you. So the Asher of Paul collection was gathered in largely it is in the British Museum now. Wouldn't surprise us if there are uh, items to be found in the future. But uh, over 31,000 pieces have been found. Now it is thought that they are, these are separate, but some of them could come together. At any rate, the amount that is found is unlike anything else found elsewhere during the time of the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians, uh, the Egyptians, um, all the way up until possibly uh, the British Empire. The amount of literature being produced by the Assyrians during this time and what is found in the Ashurbanipal Library has never been found anywhere else in the world, and that includes the Library of Alexandria. Now, as great as Ashurbanipal was, he is one of the last great kings of Assyria. Ashurbanipal has two sons that we know of. They both rule. One rules for a very short period of time after Ashurbanipal, Ashur Ilani, uh, from 630 to 627, uh, from 626 to 612 BC, Sin Shara Ushkun rules and possibly dies with the fall of Nineveh in 612 BC, at which time a king by the name of Ashur Ubarat. Now, remember, he is not king. He is called a crown prince. And the reason he is called a crown prince is because he is not consecrated as king in the city of Ashur. He is merely ruling um, temporarily until the time that the city of Ashur is recovered. And in the temple of Ashur, he will be consecrated as king of Assyria, and he will lose the title of the crown prince and be um, granted uh, the status of kingship, and he becomes a monarch, and then he can be called the official king. But until then, he is not, uh, he's, he is uh, consecrated in Haran. He rules in Haran until 609 BC. Unfortunately, Ashur is not recovered by the Assyrian state and the Assyrian state falls. And in the next lecture, 
we are going to focus on the fall of Assyria, what happened, what were the reasons the Assyrian state fell, what were the consequences of the civil wars that occurred in Assyria, and specifically we will recall Sanhedrin's um, two, um, um, two types of uh, rebellions that he had to deal with and Ashurbanipal's encounter with his brother in the civil war of Assyria.